Hi, Amanda. Thank you for being with me today. Um, I met you just to give you a quick little introduction about Amanda Wolf. She, I met her through Seattle Tiny Homes and um, Carri- Northwest Carriage House. And I was wondering if you could- Carriage House is Northwest. Carriage House <laughs> Northwest. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, was, I was wondering in that moment and we get, is it backwards? It is. So um, could you speak <laughs> a bit about what you do with them and why and how you're involved with housing and um, and why tiny houses and the affordable housing options that you're involved with? Um, what what makes you passionate about that and why do you do what you do? Well, um, so I have wanted to be a part of the tiny home movement for quite some time, um, probably at least 15 or 20 years. And um, I um, recently came on with Carriage Houses Northwest, but I actually met them in the very beginning when they first opened and they were a growing business. And, and it was just really nice to come full circle about six months ago or so and come on board as their sales manager, kind of director of sales. And, um, you know, they asked me um, what kind of things that I saw trending in terms of needs that people were looking for and asking for uh, with tiny homes. And I had said that affordable housing is something that, everybody needs um, and not just the unhoused or the the people that are experiencing an emergency but this missing middle as well where people are just working very hard and still having a hard time making ends meet or living in their cars or or younger people who are having to move back home with their parents and and with the pandemic we're just seeing this huge influx of people just needing a safe place of all different walks of life And so at Carriage Houses Northwest, we decided to put our focus this year into developing three value models. Um, And we're really excited about that. We're going to be unveiling them at the Seattle Home Show, which is February 25th through March 5th. So come down, check them out. They'll be staged and beautiful. Um, But the, the, the first unit, the unit that I think is going to help solve a lot of problems um, that are out there is a unit called the Iliad. It's 16 foot by eight foot wide um, with a queen size loft, a little kitchenette, a bathroom, and it's $49,000 turnkey ready plus tax. There's upgrade options available, but it's a house. It's It's somewhere you could live and be in a safe place or a way to earn extra income on your property. Uh, If you, if you wanted to rent something out or, or if you dreamed about having a a cabin or a second home someday, but, but economy wise, that's just not in the cards for you. Having this little unit be so affordable, um, it just opens up a lot of opportunities for everyone really. Um, And then as we've been developing these affordable homes and talking to more and more people, the the different needs and situations and excitement, they're just growing and growing and growing. Um, did that answer that question? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I And when I came to Carriage Houses, I got to see some of these models and to think of, I don't know, there's, there's this, there's so much more space in there than even you describing and like the different models and the different customizations that I think you guys can do is really cool too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm I'm I think it's also really cool that when you first heard about them, you've just been you've been a part of the movement when you say that there's a movement. Um and it is the missing middle. I love that that terminology too. What is the what is the biggest barrier you see as um to like people who have the land or the space to what's the barrier for them to put a tiny house on there or people who to buy land together and put a lot of tiny houses on land together? Why why Great isn't that question. happening? Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing people don't realize is Washington state is different than any other state when it comes to how they, what they consider a legal tiny house. So here in Washington, a tiny house either has to be fully permitted on on a permanent foundation. um, And you have to go through the same hoops and steps that you would building a custom home. So the same impact fees, the feasibility studies, all of that. So it can quickly become 
not affordable uh, to do a permanent foundation built tiny home. Now, for some people, they'd still find it affordable um, that you could build a brand new custom home, 400 square feet uh, for $300,000, $350,000 on a piece of land somewhere. But a lot of people, that's still far outside their budget. And so the other legal way to have a tiny home is it has to be certified as an RV or a travel trailer. And there's only two manufacturers in Washington state that are legal factories that produce RV certified tiny homes. And um, and so that's one barrier to entry. There, and the lack of awareness of that, we see people who are purchasing tiny homes out of state, getting them in, in their spots and then um, you know running into issues. Um, because they're not certified. Um, and the state looks at that like they don't know if they're safe. They don't know if they're wired properly, plumbed properly, those types of things. So I get the why for some regulation, but it is a barrier for housing. Um, so, you know, for your listeners to understand, you know, how to get a legal tiny home um, is really important. Um, they're for us as a factory, um, it's not cheap to to be an LNI certified factory. So you might look online and see a really cheap tiny house coming out of Tennessee, and that's great, you know, and that's great for them. But they aren't legal here in Washington, and um, and so it, it, most Washington based tiny home builders, um, it is tough to find something affordable, and so. To, have, to be able to know that there are, um, you know, a 16 foot for 50 grand, a 24 foot for 75 grand, that is the most affordable tiny house prices that you'll be able to find here in Washington. And so then that meets the needs of single people, families, elderly aging in place, um, those kinds of things. So, uh, but it's not really, you, you asked me a different question and I want to stay on, on track, on point. We redirect me where we were at again on that? Sure. Sorry. I'm actually now thinking about like affordability and why is Washington like that? But I also I'm yeah. like, right, let's get um, how, why, what's the biggest barrier for people to putting the, oh, their barrier. tiny houses yes. on there? Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, you know, that the legality of tiny homes, that's barrier number one. Mm -hmm. um, barrier number two is you can't get a permit to hook up to city sewer for an RV, which they're certified RVs. So that can be a barrier for some people. Um, for people with a septic system, most of the time you can get a temporary RV dump station added. Terminology is very important there. It's not a tiny home, it's an RV. So it's a temporary RV dump station. Mm. Um, and um, so that's important for people to know. Um, but even then there, there might be a situation where maybe the land can't have septic or maybe there's a someone's interested in purchasing a, a piece of affordable land that um, is next to a stream and so they can't put in a septic system or something like that. So it's good for your listeners to know that in that scenario, having an incinerator toilet would kind of solve those problems. And then, you know, they could end up, as long as they can get power and water to their site, they could park their home just about anywhere. Um, so yes, it's a barrier, but there's ways to, to circumvent it if you know how to navigate those barriers. But then when we talk about it, where to park them for someone who maybe doesn't own their own land, though, that's the biggest barrier is that there is a, a lack of RV parks, tiny home communities, things like that, where someone might be able to uh, finance or purchase a $50,000 home, but then what? They're, where are they going to put it? And, um, you know, we're creating kind of like this network of people where they're going out and guerrilla marketing themselves saying, hey, I've, I've got this tiny home. Does anyone have a space to rent? And it's working. I'm seeing people connect with each other, find some really cool spots to rent by by posting in their neighborhoods they want to live in, finding those those community groups, those city or town you know, Facebook pages and, and do, doing a little bio, putting a picture of their tiny home and saying, this is me, this is who I am, this is my budget, does anyone have a space I can rent? And finding some just cool little diamond in the rough spots for their tiny homes. So if you're struggling with where to put one, that is what I'd recommend uh, the, to do. The Seattle and Tiny again, Homes Meetup. An incinerator toilet. 
Yeah. That, that community is great yeah, for that. that I mean, I've been right? very, very inspired by yeah. people connecting there. So it's really cool. Yes. Um, but outside that, it's like, where, where do you put them? Mm -hmm. um, and so I would like to bring awareness to real estate agents, developers, investors, that there is a huge demand for tiny home communities. Mm -hmm. That there are people out there that can't go forward to go buy a hundred thousand dollar piece of property and then spend another 50 getting utilities in but they but they can afford their tiny home and they can afford a space rent and so it would be it would be great to kind of bring awareness to that but then i think the, the other the final missing piece of the barrier is zoning so in order to have a tiny home community right now um, the land has to be zoned commercial, or you can get a variance and a special um, special use um, consideration and, and kind of pitch it to that local county. And, and those are possibilities, but um, there's not enough people pushing. And it, the more of us that gather together and say, hey, you know, if, if you ease up on these zoning restrictions or maybe allow more conditional use permits, more investors, more developers, more private people would build tiny home communities. And we within our own community could solve some of the, you know, the housing crisis um, without asking for government handouts or government money or the government to fix the problem. Um, there's there's a lot of land out there that that would be great for small tiny home communities, but wouldn't be great to build a home on. And so I think if, if enough of us start going to the county and going to legislation and saying, why is it like this? And this is what needs to change. Within our own communities, we could start chipping away at some of the lack of housing opportunities. As a realtor, this is exactly what I'm passionate about. It's like, why, like you said, the investors are there to build this, but sometimes the zoning and it's like yeah. there's there's so many barriers that it's it's a lot to learn about. Um, mm -hmm. Sort of switching gears, but not really. What are what are some more uses and inspiration people can have for tiny homes? Like you're talking about some of the the loopholes for residencies, but um, beyond a residency, if people are passionate about tiny homes and maybe just getting more buildings on their land, and so if the things do change, maybe they can house people. But um, yeah. Do you have more inspiration or uses for cottages, tiny houses, cool things and projects yeah. that you've seen? I mean, for me personally, right? Like I want to be able to put two tiny homes in my backyard. I want one of them, you know, I'd like to have the the flexibility to maybe do an Airbnb and the other one I'd like to just have as my home office. But when my mom comes to town, you know, that she's got her own private space. Or when my, if my daughter, I've got 22 and 23 year old daughters and um, and they're always like on the verge of not being able to afford their housing, you know, and until they hit their thirties, it'll probably be that way, right? And so to know that I have a soft place that they could land to get back on their feet if something, you know, happened with them um, would just be a good peace of mind as a parent to be, and, and to know that it could also be my refuge or I could make money on it if I needed to. Um, that's, so for me personally, that's why I really want to have a tiny home on my property. Um, and then figure if I had two on there, that would more than cover my own mortgage, right? Like my mortgage would be paid free and clear. If I had two Airbnb tiny homes on my land, you know, who doesn't want to have that kind of security? Um, so there's a real financial you know, incentive for me to have that. But, but I think it's also for my family. It's not that I necessarily want to move them in right now, but to know that I could provide a safe place for them w would just be amazing. Totally. Great. I, I think there's a lot of people who qualify in that realm too. Like um, the more I learn about every, people's housing needs and how unique they all are, all these stories of folks um, there's a lot of people that that the tiny home communities would serve, but then there's also a lot of folks with the extra land who could also really benefit from from more housing. So just more tiny houses in general is mm -hmm. um, really, mm -hmm. yeah, it's great on so many levels and for so many different people. Um, and experiences too, right? Like yeah. they're, 
I think the pandemic really, um, as we all know, increased the the business of Airbnb, right? Because we couldn't go anywhere. So what are we going to do? We're going to go to another house somewhere else, you know, since we, we couldn't gather, we couldn't go anywhere. So, so Airbnb just exploded. And now some people, some people are not a fan of Airbnb because it actually takes away housing. And I, and I agree with that in certain markets, it's not fair. It's not fair that there are certain places that people are coming in and buying all the housing, renting it out. And they're sure they're doing well, they're making a killing, but now there's no housing for the people who live in the area, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I think there's a, there's a, we're going to be respectful of, of that. And a tiny house is an Airbnb versus buying a, a house in a vacation resort town. And then, you know, instead of a, a local person who works at that restaurant that you go like to visit when you're, when you're vacationing now doesn't have a place to live, a tiny house on a piece of property doesn't have that same impact. So I think that there, there's a way that people can still experience that financial gain from having Airbnb without depleting our housing market. Yeah, wonderful. That's a great point. And you're touching on something that that I want to get into for my last couple questions, which is um, there's this there's this human need I keep coming back to um, in my conversations talking about home for humanity and what that means and all of the um, the different levels that 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 housing impacts our humanity and the need for connection to a community and an identity with a community and trust in your neighbors and your neighborhood and maybe a sense of pride and beauty and appreciation and responsibility. And you take that on willingly and it's lovely. Um, that connection to a neighborhood um, <clears throat> is kind of what, what you're touching on with like the changing and in investment and how, how we invest in housing how how do you see housing as related to some of these human needs like um you said before about um culturally not all of us are satisfied with a, with an apartment and to like your point earlier but a government aid and an intervention is often apartment buildings and multi housing in that direction but tiny homes satisfy a different human experience and so um, yeah, can you speak to like how housing is related to our humanity? Yeah, so I think a new perspective I gained recently was oh, we were talking to some different um, tribal communities about possibly providing some tiny housing for a tiny home community. And it's not something that had really been on their radar. And as we had been talking to them, helping them see that you know, if we did a, a little 20 unit tiny home community with four or five loops and four or five tiny houses each and a community center in the building, their eyes just lit up and they're like, that's what culturally they need, right? Like to put someone from a, a Native American background who, um, you know, historically they're in touch with nature, they're in touch with their with their elders, with their community, and to cram them into a multifamily, you know, housing unit because it's housing and now we've done our job and they're housed and so we can go our way. But it's like soul killing to to someone from that background. Whereas having even a small space, a tiny home that is their own safe place that, that they can have um, you know, possibly pride of home ownership, um, rent to own type scenarios to where that unit is theirs. There's pride in that. Yeah. And then where the community itself, um, you know, is based around a community building where the elders go to tell their stories and their history and the community gathers to, to learn from each other and things like that. Um, and, and, culturally it's so in line with what they need and their and the systems in which they flourish and so it just really opened my eyes that that yes they're historically more connected than typically you know than we tend to be um when it comes to our communities and our families and and the planet but we all need that i think and i think it's a great perspective that 
that, you know, it's not just about being housed, you know, when you're, when you're crammed into an apartment complex, sharing the wall of your neighbor, and there's no outside space, and there's no room to breathe, and there's no privacy, and there's no pride that in, in a, something that's yours. That you and rent is to and it's twice, your space. yeah, and rent is twice what it should be. Yeah. <laughs> you can't save yeah. money. <laughs> and, yeah, and whereas, you know, like, one of the other, by the way, to circle back, one of the other barriers to entry we have right now is financing, right? But mm-hmm. we're working on it. I'm hoping banks will catch up with it. But right now, um, it's it's tough because banks feel like tiny homes are such a risk because someone could hook up a tiny home and drive it away and how are they going to get paid, right? And technically, since they're legally a certified RV, RVs are not meant to be lived in year round. So the underwriters get kind of funky about that stuff. But I think that's got to change over time. So, but either way, there's an opportunity for these little units to, um, like the tribe had brought up specifically, like they have money for housing, right? So they could go buy these tiny home units, they could lease them to people, rent to own them to people, and now they're getting back all that money that they've invested into the tiny homes and will be able to reinvest it into new housing elsewhere. And then those people living in those units they get the pride. And so then there's um, a motivation to maybe stay on track um, financially or so, sobriety or things like that, because there there's something tangible that they're, that they're working towards every day. Like that's powerful, right? Like living in an apartment complex is not going to have that same effect on anyone. So it's a lofty goal, but you know, if on my human side, if I could hope and I could dream, I would hope that we have some long-term financing options available where people could, you know, finance a, a home, a tiny home over 20 years, and the the payment is the size of a car payment. And n- now, you know, there's, there's money to spend on schooling or their children or investing or to start a business and all these things that housing just, have, just eats away at you. Yeah. Or you're yeah. renting and it goes to nothing and, and then you're still post for, for no reason. Right. Yeah. It's pow- like you said, it's powerful to have that sense of ownership, but it's oh also, God. like you said, it's also very powerful. The yeah. way, how you said, um, soul killing, because it is to not have uh, all of those, those things to not be able to afford all of those things that I, I, I am obsessed with this line between surviving and thriving because it seems yeah. like those who know the line know the line and and it, a lot of middle housing like th- th- those are those people and mm-hmm. yeah I can start to feel like my anger and my passion <laughs> but um yeah I, I love yeah, it's like a trap right you're mm-hmm. trapped how do you yeah. ever get how do you ever do better you know someone who was to purchase a tiny house today and able to finance it right well in 10 years or 15 years and now it's paid off and now they have an asset that they can in turn you know maybe go buy a house and then put this in the back of their property and help pay their mortgage right so it's it's just such a a different type of investment and asset yeah and i think you're right i think certain things will change and with the financing too um things are really changing i mean like entirely like pre things are are and that's why I I think Washington um I have a lot of hope for Washington and things changing here too. Um, Sorry, if you're be out there. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Tiny houses are being built. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, so, fi- final question then, and then I'll let you get back to your um to work. I I know, and I can hear it in you and what we're talking about. Maybe it's related, but. Um, there's a lot of hope for a, a future of better and more uh, better housing, more affordable housing, more human connected housing. Um, what gives you that hope? What do you see that gives you hope um, to make all these visions that we're talking about a reality? I don't know what necessarily gives me hope. I'm stubborn and I don't give up. And when I want something, I'll fight till I get it. So for me, <laughs> I don't know if there's one thing in particular that, that gives me hope, but I think on a small scale, I would say that I'm seeing more and more people like yourself start to make noise about that something's not right yeah. and something needs to change. 
And it's not that we need to be waiting on the government to, to step in and do something. We need to do something. We need to put the pressure on. We need to solve the problem as a community. And we do that by peer pressure, essentially, right? We gather together and we say, this is wrong. It needs to change. And we make noise until it does. And so, you know, people like yourselves, and I met with a gentleman earlier today who was also a real estate agent developer, and he's passionate about affordable housing. And he came and did a video tour for the same reason. And more and more people I'm hearing are saying something's not right. Something has to change. And now if we can just get a consistent message on what needs to change, what do we do about it? Yeah. And kind of get and start making the noise in the right areas. I think we are going to see the change we need. Awesome. That is the one in my sales. I, I'm so glad to hear other people and it is we, the the people who, who do have the power to make this change. And that's, mm-hmm. that's why I'm getting involved yeah. in government affairs because it's, it's knowing <laughs> who to talk yes. to and how to make these, these little things, yes. big things. So exactly. Thank you so much, Amanda, for your time today. You're welcome. I look forward thank to you. seeing you at the home show at the end of the month. Yes. I look forward to seeing February 25th. Yes, February 25th through March 5th. And um, come on down. What's your website ha- ha- to, to find you or? Carriage House is Northwest. Okay. Dot com. Yep. Yep. Dot com. We're in Marysville. Cool. It's beautiful. Go check it out. Thanks, guys. Thank you.